Hi everyone. In this video, we are going to examine algebraic manipulations of antiderivatives. So the purpose of this video will be to examine algebraic operations that we can use to rewrite integrands in order to recognize they actually fit basic antiderivative forms. The first technique we'll discuss is expansion. Here's an example of an antiderivative where the integrand is 2x plus 1 over x squared. This is not an anti, a basic antiderivative. It does not belong to the list of antiderivatives that we produced a little bit earlier. However, expanding this squared term will allow you to find three individual terms so there is no longer an inner function, but really three individual terms that all fit the power rule. Each of these terms can be integrated individually. The integral can be applied to each of the terms and factors can be extracted. So constant multipliers can be extracted. Some of you are probably more comfortable already and can do these antiderivatives directly. I'd say, however, for the last term, rewriting 1 over x squared as x to the minus 2 in order to apply the power rule may be a wise idea. As for the other terms, x squared antidifferentiated will become x to the power 3 over 3. The antiderivative of 4 is 4 times x, and the antiderivative of x to the minus 2 by applying the power rule is x to the minus 1 over minus 1 which we can then rewrite in fractional form. Splitting the numerator is a second approach that can be used when an integrand does not fit a basic form. Essentially, we would split the numerator if we encounter a situation where dividing term by term, the content of the numerator will produce individual terms that are themselves in basic format. Here's an example of a rational function where if all terms are divided by x squared individually, x plus 3 over x plus 1 over x squared are all then individual functions that we can integrate by either using the power rule or recognizing in the case of 3 over x that we have the antiderivative leading to a ln function. So for that middle term, 3 over x, I've written it as 3 times 1 over x, maybe to even clarify how 1 over x and ln of x are connected to one another. 1 over x squared, I've written as a power, x to the minus 2, in order to apply the power rule. And remember that added functions in an integral can be anti-differentiated individually. So 1 half x squared, 3 times the ln of x, where the x is in absolute values for domain purposes, and uh, x to the minus 1 over minus 1, or if you prefer, minus 1 over x, is the antiderivative of x to the minus 2. An arbitrary constant is, like usual, added to the end result. Using and recognizing trigonometric identities could also be a useful approach. The antiderivative of tan square of x does not belong, again, to the list of basic antiderivatives that we know. However, if we did recognize tan square x as being equivalent or equal to secant square x minus 1, because this is a trigonometric identity, then secant square x and 1 are themselves basic forms. The antiderivative of secant square x is tan of x, and the antiderivative of 1 is simply x. So again, with an added arbitrary constant. Here's a different situation that involves a bit of both techniques. We have sine squared x plus 1 divided by cos squared x. Sine squared x plus 1 may not look like a trig identity that is easily recognizable, so perhaps trying to divide term by term would be a better first step. So here we've divided cos squared x to both, or we've applied the division of cos squared x to both terms at the numerator. The first fraction, sine squared x over cos squared x, is actually tan squared x. 
the second fraction, 1 over co squared x, is actually equivalent to secant squared x. And like we saw in the previous slide, tan squared x is the same as secant squared x minus 1. So in the first step, we used the splitting the numerator approach, and at this point, we're using trigonometric identities. So what we can do now is collect the secant squares together. There are two of them. And those antiderivatives lead to tan, 2 tan of x minus x plus k again. Another example with a bit of everything. This one is actually much harder to see because, again, trig identities are not obvious. And even the division term by term is not obvious. In fact, if you did divide term by term, this would actually not be a successful technique. Perhaps what we can see is that at the numerator, the x squared and the plus 1 that are currently separated could actually be moved around to be regrouped, and we could choose to split the numerator, not really term by term, but rather by keeping x squared plus 1 as one term, secant x as the other, and dividing those two with the common denominator. The reason being that x squared plus 1 also appears at the denominator and would lead to a simplification. In fact, even the secant x terms would be simplified from the second fraction. Here is where we can recognize trig identities. 1 over secant x is the same as cosine of x. And now we have two terms in an addition so that we can actually treat them individually. The antiderivative of cos is sine of x, and the antiderivative of 1 over x squared plus 1 you may recognize as being the arctan of x.